Hi, everyone, and welcome to The X, a podcast from inside Silicon Valley about how experience shapes everything from products to businesses to entire industries. Today, we're going to talk about the stock market crash, the crypto crash, what's going on with this crazy market. Also, we're going to talk a little bit about Microsoft's xCloud gaming and what it means for the industry. Let's jump right in. Good morning, D. How you doing? I am doing good. So much to talk about this week. Everything's going a little crazy. So I want to be clear about something. This is the week of, just so everybody knows. So today is May 12th. We're recording this on a Thursday, and then we usually edit and post um, on a Monday. So as of today, tech stocks and crypto are taking huge losses. As the Fed tries to control inflation and housing prices, um, this is causing panic in the markets. And really, I mean, D and I see this from a distance, um, and we look at it and we say, this is the time for like reinvestment, acquisitions, deeper connection with the customer. But I think right now people are kind of in a panic phase and there's just a lot of selling off happening. Um, the economy still is fairly strong, right, D? I mean, unemployment is low, right? Yeah, the economy itself is still fairly strong despite kind of what the markets are showing. This is kind of the opposite of what was happening in the during the pandemic where we did kind of enter a recession. Um, but at the same time, the the investment market stayed strong because consumer spending was low, and, but people were getting money through stimulus and they were using it on investment markets. So the investments, the investment markets kind of got bloated. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you look at the metrics, right, we've had we're we're at a three point six percent unemployment rate, so unemployment is low, uh, and we've had GDP growth, positive GDP. P growth six of the last seven quarters, although the most recent quarter that ended had a small contraction of 1.4%. So that's that's what really set all this off, right? Is that when everybody saw that there was a contraction, everyone's like, oh no, we're heading toward a recession, right? Well, I think it was a lot of the concerns about inflation. Uh, personally, I'm not that concerned about inflation. These things tend to, to work out like there, and there are specific reasons why the inflation is there. It was because there was, uh, I mean, uh, the Trump administration, even prior to the pandemic, was pushing the interest rates as low as they could go. I think he pushed it down to zero before the pandemic hit. And then after the pandemic hit, they they instituted uh, basically printing money. There were uh, quantitative, quantitative easing to help with the economy. I don't think that the stimulus payouts did very much about it to, to affect inflation. Mm-hmm. But I also think removing you know, a million consumers from the market means there's the same amount of money out there spread over fewer hands. So that means that people are are uh, able to spend more money for the same kinds of things. Yeah. And, but we're seeing some pretty steep declines in some very strong companies, right? And I know that yes. a lot of this is kind of like coming back to reality actually for, for valuations. I mean, if you look at companies like Microsoft and Netflix and Google, uh, Tesla, everyone is taking a hit right now. In particular, Netflix is just oh, decimated. I mean, I think they're down as of today, like 70, 70 or seventy two percent from their all times all time high. Um, do you feel, based on the metrics and the valuations and kind of the way things are looking right now, that this is kind of where that these companies belong in the moment, or do you feel like there's kind of an oversell happening because people are starting to freak out a little bit? I'm actually looking at it and like looking at Netflix stock, right? So one of the things that I will look at is the PE ratio, the price to earnings ratio. And they are right now after their drop at 15.36. So that is like kind of right in line with what you would expect to see from like a, from like an S and P company. So I think one of the things that happened during the pandemic, because people weren't out and spending their money on vacations and, and, uh, trips to the bar and things like that, they ended up dumping a lot more money into investment markets. But mm-hmm. now that things are opening up, and I, you remember I actually predicted this, is that when things start opening up and people start, start spending money on, on things, on consumer spending, that we'd see uh, capital exiting the investment markets. And I think that's one of the things that hap- that's happening right now is that there's just kind of a correction as people are, are spending things, spending their money on cars and well, maybe not cars right now, but <laughs> yeah, cars is a tough but, one. It's even hard to get a car. Yeah. yeah, new toys and vacations and all these things that they haven't spent money on during the pandemic. 
that means they're selling off more things in investment markets in order to fund that, which means that everything is coming down. But looking at Netflix, it, their current valuation is very reasonable. Looking at, let me, let me bring up Facebook. Or oh, Facebook Meta. took a huge, or Meta took a huge hit as well. So Meta took a huge hit. Their PE ratio is 14.14. So right in the same, same level as Netflix, right? So I, I think what we had was that things were overvalued quite a bit. And a lot of this is because people buy into this hype about the future um, where they think, okay, I'm going to buy in at this, at this price point and then it'll be okay because it's growing. So they're factoring the growth yeah. into, into the price point before the growth has happened. And like, that's not how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to buy at what it's worth now so that when it grows, you can take your growth. Uh, take the difference, not buy into what it's going to be worth five years from now. So when you get to five years from now, you can break even. I see. So, so, so you're basically saying everything's falling back to fundamentals. Yes. I think everything's kind of correcting. Yeah. So is this an opportunity you think to buy then? Because everything's falling back to fundamentals. So if you're looking at the long-term ownership of some of these really great you know, companies that are providing really good products and services that now is the time to get in because it wasn't even possible before. Like no one was going to buy. I mean, I'm sure somebody did, obviously. I'm being a little facetious here, but like no one's going to buy Netflix at the time at $700 a share or whatever it got up to, right? I even looked at that and I was like, this is ridiculous, right? Like they just don't make enough money um, to justify $700 a share, right? But now that Netflix is down to where it's at, and assuming that you believe in management or, or whether it be Meta or it could be Microsoft, it could be any one of these companies. If you believe in the management, you believe in where they're going and things are back down to a PE ratio between 11 and 14, which is kind of common, right? Then mm -hmm. is now the time to start reinvesting your money because a lot of wealth managers and stuff like that have said most of the growth that's made for individuals, portfolios and stuff like that usually happen with the chunks of money that are invested during these massively down periods over the course of 10 years. So like if this is a down period right now, and then suddenly things start to trickle up a little bit, and then we have a bull market, let's say for like four or five more years, you will look back and go, wow, right? Like everything has really progressed quite a bit over the last, you know, let's say seven to 10 years. I did really well. I'm so glad that I continued to invest during this quote unquote, uh, psychologically scary time. Well, I'm just looking at things, I feel like things are properly are most things are becoming much more properly priced. So if you are going to do a long term buy and hold, then yeah. this is better than it was like you when you were buying at the peak. So yeah. I would kind of look at index funds right now unless you can find something that is undervalued. Like it's one of the things that, that um a lot of experienced investors will look for is like, all right, let's find a, a company with solid fundamentals that is uh, that is undervalued. I think with a lot of retail investors kind of mm -hmm. entering the market, it propped up a lot of what they call meme stocks. So that's pretty much anything, any company that you've heard of and has a popular, popu uh, popular reputation, like a Tesla or an Apple, you're paying a brand, uh, a, premium. a brand premium on it. You're, you're paying in order to have that Tesla brand on your stock certificates. Yeah. Um, so, and, and people are actually buying them so they can show off to their friends of like, Hey, look, I bought into Tesla. And then they'll tell a story about how they bought into Tesla when it was cheap. And now it's, they made a bunch of money when they bought in, when they bought in, when it was high and they're breaking even. Yeah. So it's, I would, if you're looking at individual stocks, I would look away from anything that might be popular or might be well known. I look for, for brands to fly under the radar. Yeah. Things that are undervalued. You know, there's this, there's this old saying, um, that if you really want to pick great stocks, let's say you're not going to put it into an index fund and you want to be a little more risky and you're going to pick individual stocks, they say, take a moment and sit down and think about the things that you really love and the things that you use on a regular basis. They said, that's the that's a great place to start, right? And as, you, as user experience people like you and I, we look at companies and we go like, man, that company is just making great products, good decisions, connecting with their customers. Like those companies tend to not go out of business. Those companies tend to grow and mm -hmm. do quite well. You know, so if you had to think of like, let's say one or two companies that you look at right now and you say they make a great product and if I, and I, and I might want to, maybe it's a tech company and I want to invest in them in, into the long term, what would you pick? I'm just curious, like what's on top of mind for you? What, what I'm looking at is where, where markets are going to be growing. 
So you'd have to, the hard part is that a lot of the companies, but then, uh, so the first thing that comes to mind is, is Silicon manufacturers. So yeah. uh, graphics cards, NVIDIA, AMD, things like that, maybe Intel also. There is so much demand for that that it's that is going to continue growing. That's pretty much guaranteed. We know that from from kind of market behavior already. There's a lot of unmet uh, demand currently. Yeah. The issue is if you look at let's take a quick look at Nvidia. Like I love Nvidia. Like I I I, I don't necessarily always love their like valuation and stock pricing and stuff like that because it's hard to like understand like what they're really worth. But I love what they do. And I love how they're pushing the industry hard and yeah. they're trying to create new chips to speed everything up and get us to the next level. Like they, it's pretty, pretty awesome. So NVIDIA, so taking a look at NVIDIA, they, this is a company that is, the demand is going to force the growth to, to continue to rise and, and yeah. barring some kind of major like Enron level faux pas. Right. So, uh, their PE ratio is higher than average, is at forty point seven seven. The market cap so three hundred ninety three billion, but they have a dividend. Oh, so nice! Th- that is something that I would definitely look at because I think that with a dividend dividend yield of 0.1%, percent, and with the the growth that can continue, we expect to continue. Then I think that is a significant, like a reasonable opportunity there because it absolutely is going to grow. It's just a question of whether or not it's going to grow 40 times in order to kind of pay off your investment. Mm -hmm. Uh, But even if you don't, with the dividend yield and and their earnings ideally continuing to rise, then then you can get value out of that regardless. So this is kind of, for the listeners out there that are kind of wondering how people in the kind of UX space kind of think about companies, like this is a great example. Like D likes to look at the fundamentals, but he never deep dives on fundamentals in companies that don't have great product. There's no point, mm-hmm. right? Like, like, w- would you agree with that D like, like you've always talked positively and I don't know if you own Nvidia at all. I do not own Nvidia stock to be clear, but like you've always looked at those and said like, okay, companies like Nvidia are creating great things that we need. And I can see that the market is actually moving in that direction that we are going to have more cloud gaming. We're going to have uh, more streaming. We're going to, everything's moving in a direction that we need those products. Now we look at the fundamentals and say, is this company valued in a, in a, in a way that allows for growth on my investment? Right. And it's kind of the only way to really look at it and then determine if you're making a, a decent decision. Well, yeah. I mean, ultimately you look at kind of what the market is, what the market is adopting and where the needs are. Right. So that's from a UX perspective, you look at, okay, what are the needs in the market? Where, where is the pent up demand? Where is the emerging needs? And I think that that uh, that GPUs and processors in general, um, with kind of software entering everything, as, with smart homes, IoT, like more advanced cars, like the, the metaverse is going to become more of a thing, and yep. and the blockchain is going to continue to evolve so that it can use probably more smaller, uh, less powered devices in order to to provide a uh, distributed processing for validation, mm-hmm. then it's, it's like having a device with a graphics processor in it is going to become more and more and more common. Yeah. Uh, it's needed for AI. It's needed for self-driving cars, uh, right? Self-driving cars. It's needed for all of these things. So you can anticipate that the market it's around that it's going to grow. I think NVIDIA is essentially a market leader in that space. The market around it is definitely going to grow now. So that's one of the things that I'll look at is like, all right, where, where is the demand? What are the strengths of those companies with, that are meeting those demands? And then looking at the at the fundamentals of that of that individual company, how is it priced, or how is it priced relative to its value? And if it has a dividend, which is becoming more and more rare, that means you can you can buy and hold and make money off it, even if the stock isn't doing great. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. And like, these are things that definitely should be thought about during downtimes like this, you know, when everything's kind of taken a dive and, you know, we will come out of this. We always do. I mean, that's the thing about um, the last 12 to 14 turns in the market like this is that mm-hmm. I was doing some research and basically on average, they last about 12 to 
24 months, right? Like meaning after that amount of time, you usually see di- double digit returns and you start seeing mm-hmm. things, you know, head in a positive direction. And a lot of, and a lot of times too, it's like new innovation too. So people get really excited about things that are growing. I'm still waiting D for the, 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 the robot growth. I've been telling you this, when is my robot friend going to come and live with me? I want to have the industry start to emerge where like everyone has their own robot at their house. We've been talking about this well, you- for 20 years. It's never happened. You can buy one now from Amazon, I believe. I know that one's that one's cool. It definitely is cool. No, it goes around and it can like it has like a scope and it can look at your it house. It can bring you a beer. It can bring you a beer. But I'm talking about the one where you're standing there and you're like, "Hey, you know, can you go run over to the store and pick this up or do this or do that?" And they're like, "Sure, no problem." Like my robot assistant wow. has not showed up yet, and it's 2022. Well, the reality is those meet, those those needs are already met through other things, right? So I know. <laughs> you can DoorDash it over. I mean, the robot's not going to be cheaper. Um, and I don't know that it's going to be more efficient at this point. So so I, I can tell you exactly where robots are, are really going to break into the market. Huh. And it is uh, when they can handle all the cleaning. Oh, yes. When you, can get, when you can get a robot made, you can get Rosie from the Jetsons who cleans your bathroom for you and washes your dishes. Yep. That is it. That is that is where you're going to see the market change, and everybody's going to go buy the, their cleaning robots. So they don't have to do it themselves. I have raved over my simple Roomba. It's the same yeah. Roomba. Knock on wood. Oh, please don't break on me. I've had it for eight plus years, and I still like to change the parts every couple of years or whatever in them. And uh, it's fantastic. I mean, it just does such a good job. I mean, the amount of dander that comes out of that thing. And I don't even have a pet anymore. Like, I, yeah. I don't even know what's going on, but like, it's just amazing. And I think in robotics, for example, it's like a slow progression. Like remember like when the, I, when the first uh, smartphone came out, the iPhone came out, right. Mm-hmm. There was this huge boom in mobile apps. Right. And I mean, it's mm-hmm. still going as of today, I'm waiting for that boom to start where everyone wants to build a robot, <laughs> you know? And then there's some like really awesome stuff out there. Yeah. Well, it's all about the use cases and they're really important. They're really expensive to develop. They're probably going to need, you know, those, those GPUs from NVIDIA or AMD. Yeah. Right right back to your point. And then the shortage really affects that, like everything. So uh, it's coming, it'll take a while. And then there's obviously safety concerns that you don't want this robot running over your foot and if it's heavy or anything like that. So it, but the use cases are there. The need is there. When when they're able to achieve that, you're going to see it happen. It's going to happen. Absolutely. Hey, let's talk about the other crash that happened this week. So crypto is crashing hard. Yeah. So I don't know if as of this, this morning, morning, yeah, Bitcoin was at uh, 25K per, per coin this morning. Yeah. Um, Ethereum down heavily. The whole market is tanking. So, but I want to roll back for a second. I want to ask you a question because I've asked this a bunch of times and I still haven't got it answered yet. I still have a problem with understanding why we need this. So so um, from a UX standpoint, <laughs> right, I understand blockchain is awesome. I do. We've talked about this on the podcast. I understand mm-hmm. the NFTs. I understand all that. There's like, like 2,000 different coins now. I, I don't understand why we need this. And one of the explanations I got, which I was not happy with, which was they said, well, it's just software. So you're just investing into software. And I'm like, no, I don't don't buy that because it's not doing anything. (laughs) I don't buy it because it's not doing anything for me. So when you said like, oh, I want you to invest into Amazon. It's just software. It's a web page. I'm like, yeah, I click a couple buttons and a book shows up at my house. Right. I don't understand by holding a ton of coins what I'm supposed to actually be doing this. If we are basically creating a brand new financial economy, right? For a whole new financial system, then we're going to have a ton of ups and downs and all arounds, you know, to try to compete with the existing one. But also, why are we competing with the existing one? Why don't we use this technology to speed up the existing one? Well, here's the thing. It's, let, let me dispel something there. You're not in, by buying a cryptocurrency, you're not investing in the software. You're purchasing essentially or, or, Ideally, you are um, doing a transfer from from one currency to another. Um, I think what they're linking. The, I think what they're linking is is this: some of the companies, and I, some of them I really like a lot. Some of the companies have a coin, but they're also building amazing software for the blockchain. Okay, that's different. That is a different story. But that's not I, Bitcoin. That is not Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. That is right? not Bitcoin. That, that, that but, is so but, different. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me finish my point. By buying a coin, 
that is on a blockchain, you are not investing in the blockchain. You are not getting any piece of that blockchain. That blockchain is still separate from your investment. You are nobody. Ultimately, the idea is that nobody owns the blockchain, so you can't really invest into it because you can't have ownership of it. You can get if you if you're in a proof of stake, you can get voting rights on that blockchain, but that's yep. still not ownership of the blockchain. So somebody can take control of it with a fifty one percent attack, where they they have fifty one percent control over fifty one percent of the validators. But it's still not quite the same thing as ownership. Somebody can force a fork in that case. So I'm, that is an area where I'm concerned about this idea of decentralization, especially because the vast majority of Bitcoin is owned by a small number of entities. So these whales are can have an outsized control over the Bitcoin. But you're not by owning the Bitcoin. It's you're not owning. You're not investing in the software. You're you're just owning the product of the software. It's it's as though. Now you had a, a piece of software that writes that writes books. You're just bu- you're buying the books. You're not buying the software. I know that I'm going to get some some mail <laughs> saying like <laughs> you just don't understand. Okay, if I don't understand, enlighten me then, because I come from the the angle of user experience. I'm looking at what it is, what it provides you, and how it makes your life easier. You know, fills a need or whatever it is. If the idea is we're trying to build our own financial system because we don't like the existing one, then it's going to be a brutal fight between an existing and a, and a new financial system. But also we have to understand it isn't like these are just two independent regular industries. They are connected to the country. They're connected to the government. They're connected to everything, right? Mm-hmm. So the acceptance of all of these coins and allowing us to trade them as baseball cards or whatever it is, is fine. I understand that. But when it collapses like this, it, it's very concerning because there's a lot of people who don't understand what is actually happening here and they're losing yeah. a lot of money because of it. And so I, I guess my question to you is this. There was a massive plunge this week. Why do you mm-hmm. think Bitcoin dumped? Uh, well, number one is that, like I said before, people are selling off their investments in order to buy things in real life. Yeah. Yeah. Bitcoin was inflated. Like you look at kind of where it was before the pandemic and like it just exploded during the pandemic because people had extra money that they were that they were putting into things. So you look at, you know, shutdown started in roughly March of 2020. You look at that, Bitcoin was at nine thousand dollars a coin. So all of the growth from ninety to sixty from nine from 9,000 to 60,000 all happened under pandemic conditions. Now the pandemic conditions are exiting are ending and we're already down below 30, right? So mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if it goes back down to nine. There's a bunch of issues with that. One is that as it goes below 25 K there's people who borrowed on margin who bought on margin, which is a terrible idea. They're going to start hit, getting hit with margin calls. So they yeah. might have to bet that can cause a huge dump in it. There's also, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Terra. That's, that's an issue too. Yeah. I think if you go through what people have been told about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, like it all kind of unravels, right? People were told that this is a inflation resistant hedge against the economy, that it's not going to move with stocks and it's going to be the future of currencies well we're now years since then and it is not really heavily adopted in in different places i think the investment markets actually killed its value as a currency which was to me that was pretty sad it is um shown through this slump that it is not it is not resistant to changes in in investment markets It, it goes right along with it so the value kind of becomes, well, what's the point, right? So now you look at it from all the investors are saying, okay, well, this isn't the the investment that I thought it was. So I'm going to exit because I can't make money off of this. And the people that are left are the true believers and the true believers are looking at it like, well, Bitcoin is like the, it's, it's like the geo cities of, of uh, cryptocurrencies. If you believe in cryptocurrencies, then it's, Everybody can look at it and say, well, like technologically, Bitcoin is kind of like it's a progenitor. It's not it's not the thing that sticks around. So it's it's Friendster. It's not Facebook. So 
uh, I think a lot of them are going to be looking at more advanced coins to get into if you're a true believer in it. But ultimately, like you, you look at this just at a at a fundamental level, the real value from a cryptocurrency is that it's difficult to counterfeit. So you can control yeah. supply much more reliably. Now, who does that who who benefits from that value? Whoever is the issuer of the currency. So it benefits for a fiat currency. That means it benefits the government. For a cryptocurrency, it benefits whoever is issuing that coin because you can validate that that coin is a real coin. That can have value that flows through to consumers, but it's not it's not consumer first as far as the value that it provides. If you really want to get digital coins moving, I think the first place to start is stable coins, is to establish yeah. a stable coin that people can use to pay and, and buy things. And it, all it does is trend with the dollar, right? Connects with the dollar and everyone kind of accepts that. That's kind of like that first level, right? And then from there, if there's certain coins associated with access or whatever it is, because I've heard people say like, okay, if you buy coins in this particular company, right, um, mm-hmm. or DAO, um, then you get access to certain options, features, or whatever it is that other people don't get access to because you're a coin holder or whatever. Well, that's kind of like buying a VIP pass or something, right? So mm-hmm. I, I kind of get that thinking around it. They just want to use the coins and the tokens as a way of doing that. I understand that. And also, this makes 100% sense in gaming and stuff like that, where you're, you're doing, um, you're, you're, you're moving digital currency back and forth as you're like buying things, selling things and playing in these metaverses and games. I'm not talking about that at all right now. I'm talking about the idea that like, I'm going to go on, I'm going to buy like, I don't know, not even like Shiba coin or something like that. I, <laughs> if I go and I buy Shiba coin at this point in my life, I'm buying it because my assumption is other people are going to buy it and it's going to drive the price up. And at some point I can get out of it. Even though I know you can use Shiba coin to like buy stuff at the Tesla store, maybe, or, you know, uh, I don't know, at certain arenas or whatever it is. I know they're testing it out and testing out the technology and the use of the technology, but Mm -hmm. I don't understand why we wouldn't just say, okay, here is a United States digital coin. You trade your money for that coin. It loads up onto your phone. You can have all kinds of phone handlers have different types of wallets and things. And then when you go to pay for things, you just pay for things in one of many ways. And one of them happens to just be the dollar that you traded in for it, Mm -hmm. right? That's if you're using it as a currency, right? So when I see all this stuff plunge and dump and that kind of stuff, it's like you said, people are getting out. They're they're, they're using it for real world application or they realize they can't get any more value out of it. Well, they're converting to fiat so they can spend the fiat. Yeah. Right. And they're also looking at like, okay, well, this is not a great investment. And like I said, if it, if it's going back to pre-pandemic, if we're exiting the pandemic and it's going back to the way things were before the pandemic, then it's a $9,000 coin. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. N- nine I mean, case. It was like sit between six and nine K if I remember right. Yeah. So we don't know if that's true. I I think that the panic about it is a little bit overblown as far as um, how people are responding to it. But at the same time, there are certain factors at play that can cause this to dump really fast. So the uh, the margin call we've already mentioned, there's another factor going on. Okay. And that is you mentioned stable coins. So one of the issues with stable coins is it hasn't really been figured out yet. Like if you're tying it to a dollar and the way that you do that is you just keep a large amount of fiat currency in reserve. So mm-hmm. I feel like stable coins, if you're serious about being a used as a currency, then stable coins are the answer. That's what what it's kind of like what the original intended use was. The problem is that once you tie it to a fiat currency as a uh, as the st- stabilizer, then you're back to basically using fiat again. Yeah. Um so there was a, a coin uh called Terra USD or we, people call it UST for short, okay. um, that used an algorithm to manage supply. So it tried to peg the value of the of their coin at $1. Okay. And if it shot up, then, they would, then there was an algorithm that would create more supply. It would mint more coins in order to uh, bring it back down to $1. So, and so pause, it, pause there for one second. So why did this exist? So they were trying to create a crypto, a stable coin that didn't require um, a a uh, reserve of fiat currency. So in order I to see. do that, you have to go out there. And, if you're going to create, you know, a billion dollars worth of of a 
cryptocurrency, ideal of a stable coin, ideally you'd have a billion dollars in in reserve in order to back in order to back that, right? It's kind of like the True. U.S. reserve with with gold when it was on the when uh, the gold standard. So this is trying to use an algorithm to manage the amount of supply in order to in order to stabilize that. So it, it will mint new coins if it goes over. So it, that means that it is so that it's increasing supply to bring the value down. So uh, that's inflation. It basically creates inflation and then it create it destroys coins if the value drops under a dollar. So that decreases supply and, and should boost the uh, the value by creating deflation. So that should now, essentially work, right? Because it makes sense, right? It's like it just goes up and down and the algorithm knows when to make adjustments. Except it didn't. So <laughs> the problem is when uh, right now with the, the co- kind of collapse in confidence in the currencies, uh-huh. It plunges, uh, as far as I know, it might be lower than this as of now. It plunges as low as thirty-one cents when it's supposed to try to keep it a dollar. So that means the the algorithm is trying to destroy uh, coins as quickly as it can. Now, imagine you are somebody who owns that coin, and mm-hmm. ha- how much can it destroy before you are left with nothing? You just bought in. Maybe you bought in, you know, a thousand coins, and then just got destroyed. Now that you have. 30 coins and they're only worth 30 cents or something. But I don't understand it's, why why it started destroying so many coins that it got down to 31 cents. Wouldn't it have seen like, oh, it's about to go below a dollar, so I stopped destroying coins? It's not plunging lowly, low because uh, it's uh, it's not creating 31 cents by, by destroying coins. Uh-huh. It's plunging because everybody's trying to sell out and exit. Oh, So people are, okay. are trying to, there's like, I, I just want out go ahead and sell it at, at 50 cents on the dollar just c- so I can get out because I think it's going lower. And the algorithm can't keep up. The algorithm should be destroying coins in order to bring it back up. But because the demand is so low, then it's not equalizing and it's, and it's not it's, – the value isn't rising because nobody's buying it. Yes. Now, this probably means UST is it, likely going to be done because it can't maintain it. And this algorithm just – the experiment failed. Where this affects Bitcoins is is the creators of UST, Luna, they own billions in Bitcoin. And if okay. they liquidate in order to cover the, their uh, UST losses, it could really pull the bottom on, on Bitcoin and they could Ooh. drop to who knows where. Aye, aye, aye. So th- this actually shows you how large companies or large um, entity holders can control the flow of Bitcoin, which early on that was something that they talked about not wanting to happen with Bitcoin, right? Is that yeah. so many people owned it that if, you know, a couple of people decided to get rid of it, it doesn't really affect anything. So now we're seeing actually it can. Yeah. So cryptocurrencies are not inherently decentralized, right? We're trying to make them decentralized, but they're, we already know from private blockchains, private blockchains aren't, aren't really decentralized. They're controlled by, by uh, whoever's owning that private group. The amount of influence that can be can be exerted on Bitcoin value in itself can be heavily influenced by these whales that can that can dump or purchase it at huge values in order to manipulate the stock price or the uh, not stock price the the price of the coin. And if somebody really wants to control it, they can just start controlling fifty one percent of the validators. So yeah. you can. Under proof of work, you just need to buy enough ASICs and get enough ASICs on it. You know, this would take, you know, billions of dollars in investment so that you control 51% of the validators and then you can force a fork and you can control where it goes. So it's I not see. inherently decentralized, which hopefully encourages decentralization. But as it increases in value, then it creates more incentive for somebody to try to centralize it and put it under control. And then you're kind of back what you started, but instead of the government controlling it, it's who knows. So we, we've we seen stuff like this happen before, right? It, you know, in the 1990s, I remember when we had our first crash in like 99, there was a lot of reports of people saying like, oh, the internet's dead. Like we got to go back to the way we did it before. Like this, we proved that this doesn't work and that kind of stuff, you know, and a lot of people complaining about stuff in 2005, you know, about tech, you know, when we had a, a little bit of a downturn. So I guess the question is, is like, even though this is happening right now and there's some good fundamental technology behind it. Um, I don't think this is a time to say like, oh, let's just not do any of this. 
I think it's mm-hmm. a time to actually take a moment, step back and determine what part of the technology is amazing <clears throat> and effective and can be used to kind of progress forward. And then the stuff that really doesn't make any sense, move on from it, right? I mean, that, that's that's essentially how I feel about some of this stuff. Like, I like the idea of the blockchains. I love M- NFTs and the way yeah. that they could be used for smart contracts and that kind of stuff. Um, but just everyone and their grandmother having a coin doesn't make any sense to me. And I feel like that's something we need to move past. Well, I, I think blockchain as a technology has a lot of promise. It, I don't think it's fully developed because it's it's still a little bit, it's still too slow. It's still too expensive it is ultimately a security product so there is a lot of applications for it i think these this current generation of cryptocurrencies kind of missed the mark on a lot of ways and just the the simple fact that you can approach the approach the topic being somebody in tech being somebody who's worked in this space and and being like i still kind of don't get it is ultimately an indictment of, of the implementation of the technology. It's one of the things we look at when we're testing different product concepts and value value propositions is how clear is this concept to the user? And to be fair, when you have something that's new and innovative, people really struggle with it. But we're now years in and people are really still really struggling with it. So that's, that is ultimately kind of a, a huge problem for this implementation of the technology but i think the technology Mm -hmm. itself has a lot of value and has a lot of potential i think nfts can can really uh provide something it's going to be something very different than like board 8 yacht club and stuff like that it's not going to be like jpegs it's going to be in a different form and i think with kind of cryptocurrencies i i wouldn't be surprised if five ten years from now there's just a it just becomes what fiat currencies are because it does provide a lot of value to the issuer, to the governments that do it. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, and we'll find out. I mean, I think it'd be really interesting to do a podcast next week and find out if the stuff turned around or if, mm-hmm. you know, if things keep, keep dumping. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised just based on history. If uh, Bitcoin's going back to 9,000. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised either. It, it also depends too on some of the big whales that really own this stuff, like MicroStrategy. You know, they leveraged a lot, you know, and they can end up with a margin call if it keeps dumping. And so yep. it, the next, uh, I don't know, was it like seven to 14 days will really tell us what happens. I know that um, if it drops below $21,000 a coin, a margin call could happen for MicroStrategy. And so yep. that is a big big uh, issue for Bitcoin if that does happen. But hey, let's let's switch over to our second and final topic of the day. This is kind of more of an update uh, than anything. Uh, you uh, put this across my desk. I had had no idea this was actually occurring. Um, but Microsoft's X Cloud gaming service is starting to make some big moves and did make a little shot over the bow to Apple, right? Yeah. So real quick, if you're not familiar with cloud gaming, I feel like it's really poorly named. What it is is essentially a service. <laughs> it is. It sounds like it sounds like you're you're just kind of streaming a game, and to a certain extent, it is. But it's it's really a service in which games are hosted remotely on a server side virtual computer, and then the graphics and audio are streamed to you as the player, and then your inputs and controls are streamed to the virtual computer remotely. So what this means is that you any hardware requirements. Um, are hosted on the server side. So you can theoretically play really demanding games like God of War or Cyberpunk 2077 on any device, including smartphone, smart TV, uh, the potato um, of, a, of a computer. And all, since all of the graphics processing and things are happening remotely on this virtual computer, um, where all of the hardware is being managed by you know whoever's running the service, you just need a really good internet connection and uh, a device that has re- reasonable input lag. So as long as they can get the latency down, as far as going up and down, this kind of like frees up the hardware concern so that you don't have to buy a gaming PC. You don't have to buy an expensive console mm-hmm. and you can play it on any device. You can be playing on your, on your TV and be done. And then, uh, go 
I mean, to a park and pull out your phone and pick up right where you left off on whatever game you were playing. So that's amazing. Kind of like, right. It, it just opens things up. It's exactly what you can do net currently on Netflix or Kindle with books or movies, but with games and not just any game, triple a titles that are like the, the top of the top. So people have been trying this for a while now. Uh, there is Stadia. Everybody knows about Stadia. Of Nvidia course. has their GeForce Now product, uh, and Microsoft has XCloud, and there's a few others like uh, like PlayStation has PlayStation Now. Yeah, PlayStation Now, and they're almost always a subscription service. So you pay a certain amount of money, and you get a a game, uh, or you get potentially the game itself, but more importantly, you get access to kind of remote GPUs that kind of mm-hmm. render the game for you. Some of these kind of got a little like Stadia, I think, tried to do a little bit too much where it was like not you're also getting access to the game. So it felt like for people with Stadia that they were they were paying a subscription, but they still had to buy the games. So it felt like they were getting double dipped on. I think it's one of the reasons why that didn't really take off. But based on kind of just that, what are your thoughts on cloud gaming as a service? Dude, it's a UX no brainer. Right. Right. At the end of the day, most people do not have a gaming machine. Okay. And that market is squeezed very small. So I had asked you that question on a podcast one time. I said, Hey, how much would it cost for me to get a gaming machine? You're like, "Uh, you know, at least a couple thousand bucks or whatever. Okay. You're Mm -hmm. 15 or 16 year old, 16 year old, and you have a normal computer at home. How are you going to come up with $2,000 let's say to buy a gaming machine? This is like the direction it needs to go. And I love it because it reminds me of AWS, right? Like early on, people were like, why would I store all my, you know, my, my uh, program files basically and, and have it yeah. run off of a, a cloud storage system? Well, because they're spending all their time and energy building the biggest, most powerful, you know, systems they can so that everything runs smoothly. This is kind of a no brainer in the sense that like, I would love to be able to use, uh, you know, my older laptop or whatever. And suddenly I'm playing like, God of War or Cyberpunk 2077, right? Like that's the way that this should function. And so we are heading in that direction no matter what. And um, I'm glad that it's getting closer and closer because it evens the playing field for everybody, right? Yeah. And you think about what it takes in order to get into some of these games, especially if you're like PC gaming, the barrier to entry. Like if you imagine like, oh, hey, I I want to introduce you to this new... uh, into this new hobby, right? So you surf and you're like, hey, D, I want to take you out surfing. But in order for me to do that, I need to pay me uh, $2,000 off the bat. Yep. Just as an entry fee, right? That that just cuts out so much. So if you could pay, you know, th- uh, 30 bucks a month on a subscription that you can cancel in a couple months in order to try things out and get into it, then that is that is huge. Not to mention just the the UX benefits of not being tied to a specific device. Yep. If I want to start on my PC and then move over to my TV and then, then later move on to a tablet or a phone, go sit outside in the backyard and, and play God of War or, or Assassin's Creed or something and not have to like, you know, if somebody like the, the old TV experience where like you're playing games, you're on your TV and you're, you know, back when I was a kid, my mom comes mm-hmm. home and was like, Hey, stop playing that game. I want to watch something. Yep. Now you can't play. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but with, with a service like this, I can just take it mobile and pick up where you left off. So when did this actually start? It, it's it's been a few years ago. I think at, uh, XCloud got into it. Microsoft and XCloud got into it in 2020, but some of the other ones have been around for longer. I think Stadia. Let me take it. So Stadia launched in 2019. Okay. So it's been around for a few years, but it, it's it's been slow to take off. So one of the one of the challenges is it does it does chew through bandwidth and data. Yeah, so, I was gonna say part of this is is the relationship between having good internet connection, right, mm-hmm. and having a you know, a decent at this current point, right? Like a decent machine, all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. This removes the the machine issue, but you still have to have a decent internet connection. Yeah. So it's kind of like what, it, what streaming video was back, you know, 10 years ago where you could, you could stream video, but the infrastructure for the internet connection wasn't quite there yet. So uh, between 2019 and now internet connections have already sped, sped up a fair amount. So 
people like us in the Bay Area area could definitely get into this, but people in rural areas are going to have a much more difficult time because they don't have the same level of broadband access. Yeah, which is actually being uh, upgraded as well because of, you know, mm-hmm. uh, there's like two or three different companies. Tesla's one of them that's doing these um, Starlink and that kind of stuff. And, and, and they mm-hmm. said it's getting faster and faster and faster. So I think eventually we'll get everybody basically on high yeah. speed internet, you know, one way or another. But you imagine that, you know, you're playing a multiplayer game, you want to get your friend into it, they don't own the hardware, they can get in now. Or if you're playing like, a, you know, a, you know, an FPS shooter like Call of Duty or something like that, and your buddy has a has, is playing with a laptop that's an old potato, mm-hmm. you can, you know, get them upgraded so that through a software service, essentially, that now they're not lagging in the back the entire time getting your team killed. Yeah. And, so, and, you know, this is kind of a good, uh, you know, kind of moment to, to to pause for a second and say, if you're getting into tech, there's a lot of what like kind of like unsexy tech that is like super, super important. And that's like the structural stuff. Right. So like mm-hmm. working on, you know, server side stuff like this and trying to get, you know, gaming in the, you know, in the cloud, you know, more seamlessly or like increasing bandwidth and stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff happening that most people kind of take for granted a little bit actually um, yeah. where there's great opportunities there. So just as a side note, like if you're not interested in necessarily like the gaming itself, but you're interested in that structural stuff, they're always looking for like awesome motivated people that want to do that kind of stuff. You know? And I think yeah. people don't talk about it a lot, right? It's like this stuff is and, not easy and to, to be do. Honest, yeah. And to be honest, that's, that's where the biggest changes happen. Yeah. 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 Like if you if you really want to think about some of the biggest changes um, in technology, it's it's stuff like APIs, right? Yeah, when APIs got implemented, it, it made huge changes. But Absolutely. anyway, so but I, I did want to ask you something about about, about uh, X Cloud one more time. So when when it comes to these services, and I know that we talked about Netflix earlier, but is this an opportunity for someone like Netflix who's already like? heavily in the streaming business, but kind of hurting in the sense that they need to expand and, and look for more opportunities within their company to try to get into like, you know, cloud gaming as well. Because I mean, I know the people you're talking about, like Microsoft and PlayStation, these are like the the, the big hitters, right? But like, uh, yeah. what about someone like Netflix? Can they do this? They could. Um, they are way behind everybody else. So they would need to get ramped up quickly. I don't know that Netflix really understands gaming as a culture. Uh-huh. And what they've released so far have been mobile games, which, you know, they're not, not a huge fan of mobile games. Most, most gamers are not. Um, and there is already plenty of resources to purchase and run mobile games. They're not very demanding. They don't really need this kind of service, but I think if they did, it could be something that kind of right, revitalized well, the platform. Because the reason I think why I've got a huge content yeah, problem right now. Yeah, and the reason why I bring it up is because <laughs> you, if you're getting away from the actual tech side, meaning someone else is handling the storage, someone's handling the processing, someone's handling the bandwidth. Basically, you're in the business of either creating games or funding game development in some way, right? So it's like mm-hmm. if Netflix can or any other company, not even Netflix, it could be any other company that already understands streaming or understands kind of that market. This mm-hmm. just pumps more investment basically into game studios, right? Because that content is king at this point. Yeah. So, well, Netflix real strength was as a distribution platform. Yeah. So, and they've, they've gotten into content creation and they've, they have had some success with it, but more recently that like, uh, I, I watched a trailer for a, for a new Netflix series out today. And the the comments were brutal. They were like, well, it's coming from Netflix. So, you know, it's going to be terrible. Oh man. They're just taking taking a beating right now, aren't they? They've got a content issue. They've been, they've been trying to, they trying to fill their libraries way too quickly. And a lot of it is just not, not great stuff. Um, But anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about what, what happened recently with XCloud because I think it's it's really interesting. Okay. So XCloud's been around for 2020. This is Microsoft's cloud gaming platform that's been used by, they announced that it's been used by 10 million people around the world, which is a really respectable number. 
Uh, they're going to be releasing a gaming puck that you can connect to a TV, kind of like how a Chromecast does, so that you can then stream any game to any TV. That's cool. And it's already being integrated into Samsung's gaming hub uh, on their new smart TV. So Samsung's buying in. They already support Stadia and GeForce now. So all, all of this stuff is getting more integrated, more available to the market and hardware that's out there. The big news that happened was that Microsoft teamed with Epic, Epic Games, mm-hmm. to host Fortnite on any device for free. So normally, if you want xCloud, you've got to pay a um, a subscription fee. Mm-hmm. But if you want to play Fortnite, you can use it for free, not pay anything, and then it allows you to play it on iOS devices, which circumvents Apple's ban of Fortnite on on their devices because of the whole suing each other over over um, the thirty percent Apple tax. Wait, 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 wait! I don't get it. So how how are you being able to do it on an iOS device then? If there's a ban of Fortnite, so the Fortnite game as an app is banned on the device because they're not willing to pay the Apple tax and they're not willing to force everybody to to pay through Apple services. Okay, but uh, but XCloud is not banned. So you basically log into xCloud, and then from yeah. xCloud, you, lo- you load the game. So you're running Fortnite within an xCloud shell oh. on iOS devices. Oh, okay. That was a part that was missing. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that is kind of a shot over the bow, isn't it? Yeah. So you, I mean, what would, if you were Apple, how would you respond to this? Oh, uh, well, um, I don't think... Oh man, I don't think you can do anything about this. Otherwise it looks super petty, right? So yeah. they're essentially not um, allowing you to load Fortnite directly on an iOS, but if you're doing it through a cloud shell, you I don't think you could say anything. Otherwise you're going to look super petty about it. I think you have to you know, work out the issue that you currently have. Um, and this is people's mm-hmm. way of going around it, but you kind of have to let it happen. You know, that's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, Otherwise it looks bad. Aside from just the optics of it, if you decide to come down on xCloud, you could end up locking yourself out of this entire category of cloud gaming on all of your platforms. Just to, just to fully flesh this out, you're okay. someone who likes to play games. Uh-huh. And the, na- the new standard is this kind of application where it could be GeForce Now, it could be... Stadia, although rumors are Stadia is going away. It could be something from PlayStation. It could be xCloud like this. You want to buy a device and mm-hmm. you can use these devices on everywhere else to be kind of cross-platform everything, except you can't do it on Apple devices. You can't do it on a MacBook. You can't do it on an iPhone or an iPad. It puts them at a disadvantage. Yes. It puts them at a disadvantage because we're getting to a point now where kind of everybody likes gaming. <laughs> like I talk to older people, yeah. younger people, everyone really enjoys it. And not everybody does it all the time, but they do They do like some of it, you know? Mm-hmm. And I feel like it definitely puts them at a, at, a, at a disadvantage and it just forces them to basically have to work out this issue. Now, I understand the whole thing of precedent, right? If they allow Fortnite, you know, to, you know, do in-app charges and not pay the Apple tax and all that kind of stuff, then every other company after that will come after them for the same, for the same reason. So they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard spot on that one, you know, because they're like, Hey, this is how we do our business and period. I mean, (laughs) this is going to basically work itself out one way or another, because you know, who's going to end up dictating the terms of all this D the consumer. If the consumer pulls away from using Apple devices because they don't want to, you know, lose the opportunity to play these games, then Apple loses. If people stop gaming on their Apple devices, then they're going to have to go out and buy a separate machine for that. That's going to frustrate them as well, right? So there's there's a lot of complications that happen here if they don't work something out. I think they should just work something out. You know, at the end of the day, like I understand that everybody wants to make their revenue and do their thing. At some point or another, you have to basically look at it and say, are we harming the consumer? Because they're the ones that pay for all this. <laughs> You and me. It's it's a, a little, let me see. So the obvious thing, the obvious right thing to do for Apple is to, you know, let it happen, renegotiate things, kind of like 30% in order to kind of host a 
you know, an app on a, on a marketplace and to process transactions is a little nuts, right? Like everybody, there's plenty of game stores out there or app stores out there. You don't have to use Apple's. It's just because Apple's forcing you to. And Apple's isn't necessarily better than anybody else's. Like Epic has their own game store that that is perfectly fine. Uh, there's no reason why you wouldn't use that as an app marketplace. But the reality is this is Apple and Apple kind of has a history of of kind of dictating to the consumer. I mean, otherwise, you know, everybody would still have, you know, head, headphone jacks on their phones. So it's entirely possible that they're just going to try to dictate and say like, oh, no, we're going to lock out um, cloud gaming platforms because it circumvents our Apple tax. Mm-hmm. And they, they've shown plenty of times they don't really care about gaming. It's not important to them. So it's entirely possible they will. And then I think one of the things that could happen is that it's going to end up kind of cutting into their market share. It could affect their brand perception. Uh, I don't think it's going to kill Apple, but I don't think, I definitely don't think it would help. No, I don't, it's definitely not going to kill Apple. Your diehard, diehard Apple people tend to deal with things that even yeah, if they don't want to it, deal with them. Right. But it's very uh, well be a right. chink in the armor though. Yeah, I mean, well, it just feels like what you said before, like a long time ago in like season one, you said something about like, you know, if you if you put too many too many roadblocks for other segments to enjoy uh, their software on an Apple device, then we go back to the to the early two thousands where you have an Apple device for design and for artistic purposes, and then you have a PC sitting on your desk for all other things, right? Oh, and nobody wants to go back that. to that. What's that? There's plenty of people who are already there. Exactly, right? There's plenty of people who are already there. And it's like you try to get to a point where you don't have to do that, right? And so mm-hmm. um, hopefully this will work itself out. One other thing, because you mentioned Netflix. Oh, I yeah. think if Netflix, if Netflix wanted to make waves in this area, and I think it would be in their best interest to do so, their best choice would uh, so Microsoft has already kind of gotten ahead of ahead of them on this, but their best option I think is to acquire or partner with a company like Epic or Valve. Yeah, you know, they they are companies who have game marketplaces. They understand gaming. They have a lot of the platforms out there. Netflix has a lot of the streaming servers and and hardware and uh, back end hardware functionality. They can absolutely accelerate each other. You know who I can see? This just popped into my head right now. You know who I can see Netflix purchasing? Roblox. Netflix has uh, such yeah. a robust, big kids segment. I mean, every kid I know, including our son, is obsessed with Netflix kids. They keep coming out with new shows and he loves mm-hmm. them and they talk about them at school and they're laughing about them. They draw them. And I was thinking like they're, they're, they're actually really good in that segment. Imagine if they purchased Roblox and had some integration in content between Roblox and Netflix. So like creating Roblox shows and cartoons and all those types of things associated with all the different Roblox rooms that you can jump into in the game. Uh, yeah, I think that's interesting. I think that could really work. I think uh, Roblox plays to to that, uh, to that a, a gamer population. I think it's a, it's a bit kind of kid-centric. Which uh-huh. can work for them. Yeah, I think Epic or or Valve is the bigger play because you can have Epic and Valve. They they're in games, they're developing games, but they also run massive marketplaces. So bringing that marketplace on into the Netflix kind of uh, ecosystem, you can still have Roblox on your platform um, through uh, through the through an Epic Game Store or through Steam. So I, I think that. I don't think that Netflix can can get into games on their own. I think they need a big partner. Yeah, I, well, I would I would assume that too. I mean, if I was a, you know working with the C level executives over there and they said, "Hey, I want you to look at our strategy and stuff," I would mm-hmm. definitely be like, "Yeah, let's partner, let's partner," and then you leave them alone, yeah. and let them do their thing. You know who does that really well is Amazon. Is that they tend yeah. to buy companies that they find can have cross collaboration, but they don't like fully immediately like rename them and everything they let them function on their own they slowly integrate them they actually do a pretty good job at that i think they can kind of model that and do the same thing with roblox and other game studios so i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap up with one last thought so netflix could do this they're not the only ones um amazon has already has a uh a a gaming streaming service called luna Uh uh-huh oh yeah and they have some games out so they are getting into this now if we're already thinking that netflix could do this and have a big 
big impact that means that so could disney Ooh, yeah i think so i think so too i think disney's gonna make i mean god we could do all the podcasts on this stuff because i've been reading a lot about disney lately <laughs> um is i think that disney can is gonna make a big move in the next 12 24 months i think they're gonna acquire another big company i think they could they could easily purchase game studios and and, and really properly yeah. integrate their stuff with all of their content i think it would be a, a, a no-brainer they have all the licenses and they have a long-term relationship going back i think a couple of dec- decades now with square enix mm, okay i always thought so it'd be interesting if, final fantasy and yeah i always thought it'd be really interesting and i know this probably will never happen but i always thought it'd be interesting if disney purchased nintendo maybe like as a, a big, like as a big acquisition, right? I mean, the biggest in history or something like that, right? But it would be like if they bought, um, they bought them, they would own, they would own so much, and then they'd be able to expand their parks in different ways. And it's just, I don't know. I just always thought that would be a good marriage there. So it's interesting because they they are both two different. They they both go after the same demographic, right? They're both uh-huh. kind of a kid centric thing. It's just hard for me to see how they fit together because they're they're both such walled gardens that like it's it's it would be interesting to see how those two could fit together. Yeah, like I said, it'd be the biggest move ever made, um, and it would take a big yeah. long term strategy to figure that one out. Yeah, it's like two two very stubborn people getting together who are used to having their own way. Now, like usually, you need somebody to who can who's able to compromise and adapt. And exactly. Neither of those companies like to compromise and adapt. <laughs> That's true. Well, this was great, D. This was a lot of fun. I had a, had a good time doing this. Um, and thanks everyone so much for taking the time to listen to us today. We really appreciate it. Um, as we always say, we'll be posting those links um, and many of the sources that we referenced on Twitter. So you can find us and follow us on Twitter at the X Podcast One. That's the X Podcast, the number one. If you like this podcast, found it interesting or informative, it helps us a great deal. If you please subscribe, tell a friend, send us a note, say hello. We only do this because we enjoy doing it. We don't get paid to do it. So um, we want to keep doing it. Thanks, everyone. And we will see you all next week.